Let's pray as we begin. Father, we thank you for how you continue to remind us about abiding in you. Guide us as we take a look at part two and continue to remind us how you call us not just to abide in you, but to continue to abide with others as well. Guide us and bless us. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, it seems that few of us remember the days of when we had to be connected into something or connect to something. Now, what we also forget is the fact of how language continues to change and do whatever we want to call it. The concept of abiding has another concept that's connected with it. And I guess I just gave it away. In the Hebrew mindset, it is that of connecting into something or connecting with something. You know, some of us will remember the days when we had to dial the operator before we could be connected to anyone. And the operator was one among a team of many people that were connecting people throughout the U.S. and technically throughout the world so that they could speak to each other. Today, with the type of technology that we have, we get very antsy if we have to wait for even two seconds for our calls to get through to a friend of ours, to family members, or to other anyone else. Maybe that's why they invented all this fancy techno music to try to keep us distracted while we're waiting. But isn't that the key in connecting and abiding? is learning to wait, learning to have patience, learning to tap into that peace that passes all understanding. Though even with saying that, we need to remember that we we in and of ourselves cannot tap into that peace. It is only through Jesus that we have access to that, and he is the one that puts us in it because we're already in him. Now, if you remember Last week, we took a look at verses 1 through 9 in John chapter 15. Today, we're going to be starting the second part in our three-part series entitled The Abiding Factor. Today, we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 19 and what Jesus has to say, not just to the, the disciples and apostles of old, but ultimately what he has to say to us today and how that affects what we're doing and even more, how we're called to make a proper response to what he calls us to. And I hope you took notice of that, because it's important. It's too often we would rather react to everything going on to, than to actually respond. Remember, reaction comes from the emotions, while response comes from the head and the heart. So let's get started with the verses that we have for today. Once again, we're in John chapter 15, looking at verses 10 through 19. It starts out by saying this, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. You know, right there, this is very important, and we even touched on this last time, if you remember. It's being connected to the character of Christ and allowing him to fully change us so that we are totally different. Now, if you spend time outside, spend time gardening, or even spend time in a flower bed, you understand that the only way things will change for the seed is time. If you're actually spending that time to actually take care of it, That's where things change. But even in a vegetable garden and fruit trees and other things, if we're not actually spending the time, they're not going to grow. I can't expect to leave a seed out on the counter and, oh, okay, three weeks later, all of a sudden I have a tiny tree. No, that doesn't work that way. You have to actually go, you have to actually plant it so that it can abide in the soil And grow how it's supposed to. You know, it's the same way with the relationship with Jesus. If we're not spending time with him, and I'm not just saying spending time in devotions and in the word, that's very important. But we need to be spending constant time actually talking to him 
so that we're actually ready for what's about to happen and even more what's happening right now. The more that we get to know Jesus, the more that we're going to understand about the three, the more that we understand this, the more that we're going to want to go out and to serve, which is the ultimate call of the abiding factor. Don't forget to abide so that we're actually able to see what's about to unfold. Right here, Jesus continues on. These things I have spoken, I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. When was the last time that we actually stopped and asked ourselves or others, what are you joyful about today? How full is your joy? Too often we'd rather stop and complain and say, well, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like what, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I see a common thread in there, do you? It's not the abiding factor, it's the I factor. Too, fa too much we're focused on ourselves and the I, instead of actually looking at what's really going on and asking the question, am I at fault? What do I need to do to change this? And even more, how do I need to allow God to take this out of me so that I'm able to have joy and to have it more fully? That's a hard question to even look at, honestly. Because we think that we have enough. That's, that's the attitude that we get from society today. All that you need is all that you have. That's all, that's all that matters. But instead, what we need to be looking at now is how we can better serve instead of being served. That is what is going to change this factor and help us to focus not just on God, but on the ultimate needs of others as we continue to have our paths intersecting. This isn't something that's going to just all of a sudden come overnight. It's going to take time. But the real question that we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to allow God to place His joy in our lives so that our joy ultimately can become more than even imagined? It will be hard. We're not promised that everything is going to be good and everything's going to be fine all the time. We do know that there's going to be problems. We do know that there, there will be pain. But don't ultimately we know that because God is with us, we have nothing to worry about. Because as He abides in us and we abide in Him, not only will things change, but our joy will be different because of our experience with Him. Verse 12 this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now that's, that's hard, isn't it? Or is it? So often we want to say, well, you know, I like you, but I don't know about if I love you. Right here, Jesus continues to come back to us and say that this is the key of abiding right here, is that we love one another just as God has loved us. Not if we want to, not if we need to. This is a factor of a must. That when God has said this, we need to go and do. We should always like each other, but even more, we should always love each other first and love each other unconditionally, no matter what the cost. Dare I even say, even if it costs our life, we should still be willing to love each other and continue to work together for the ultimate purpose that God continues to have unfolding in our lives. But he goes on, this is a very interesting verse. We hear this often quoted, and it's this, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You have family, and family is considered blood, but friends are ones that you choose. Friends are ones that seem to be closer than blood at times. You know, so it's great that 
You think you might lay down your life for a family member. But are you willing to lay down your life for someone that's even closer, for a very close friend, for your best friend? We forget often that our best friend Jesus laid down his life for us to pay the price ultimately so that we could have life abundant and even more life eternal, life forever with him, but we have to choose it. He doesn't force us. He wants us to make the choice whether to live with him or to be forgotten forever. But right here, as we note this, I think there's one other step that we need to take. How willing would we be to lay down our lives for someone that we don't like and we don't love? I don't know about you, but I'm in that camp where I'd have to raise up my hand and say, well, I'm, I'd have a hard time with that. I'd have a hard time with that because that's not easy. It's not easy because it's not natural. It's not natural for us to want to give of ourselves for someone that doesn't like us, for someone that hates us to start with. But let's remember even while Jesus was here on this earth for the 33 and a half years that he was here, he was hated, he was despised by almost everyone. Even the very people that were the closest to him eventually ran away. We do the same thing, but Jesus continues to draw us back to himself, reminding us of the love that he has for us, and ultimately the love he wants us to have for all those that are around us, no matter where they're from, no matter who they are, and even more than that, no matter what they've done in the past. But Jesus continues to go on with this and say, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Interesting language, isn't it? Right there, the whole concept of commanding is a different word now than what it was back then. Now, to command now is what you hear me say you must do. And it's, it's also con connected with the context of if you don't do this, there will be consequences. Very bad, very bad consequences. Back then, when a rabbi would say this, or even more when Jesus said this, the context of this was in the fact of do what I have spoken and what I have shown you. Not, if you don't do this, there's going to be bad times coming. There's always going to be bad times coming, but that's for another time and another subject. But in this, to follow what one has said and what one has done, you start to become like the person that you've been following, which that was the whole idea. I want you to be changed by what I've said and what I've done so that you're able to go and see the change and see the need in others and help them down that path as well as I am teaching them and as I am guiding them. But that verse doesn't really end right there. It continues on in the next couple of verses. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Isn't that amazing right there? Jesus continues to say, what I have, what I know, who I am, is going to be continually revealed to you. This is not something that's going to be hidden but it is going to be out in the open. It's going to be public because this is how much I love you. This is how much I care for you. And I want you to know that there is a change. You're not what people would think you are. You are not slaves. What you are and who you are now is totally different. You are my people once again. But even more than that, he doesn't just stop there. Jesus goes one step further, says, you are my friends. Because you know me, because you have an intimate experience with me, 
there is a total change in what has happened and what is going on. I'm not going to call you anything else because you know me. You know my heart. You know what's going on. This is why I call you my friends, my family even more because of the connection that we have. And he continues on. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Interesting, isn't it? I'm sure all of us remember those days back in elementary school and even in high school of being chosen or the lack thereof being the last person that, well, if we have to have them on our team, that always hurt, didn't it? But right here, Jesus comes out and he says, listen, you have not been left for last. You have not been left to any part of this pick. But what I tell you is this, you haven't chosen to be on my team. I chose you to be on my team before anything ever was. And because of that, I continue to choose you. I continue to make you ready. I continue to call you to go out to bear evidence of this faith that is in you of me. Because literally we have, and we mentioned this last time, we have a faith that works. Because our faith is in us, it automatically makes us go and want to do good things to help others takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. But Jesus continues to remind us, go, share, but even more, just go. I will be with you and I will be working in and through you for an ultimate purpose that you don't understand right now, but you will in time. Right here, verse 17 says this, this I command you, that you love one another. Now we mentioned last time about how when Jesus left and the disciples were together and they were doing ministry, people noted that they had been with Jesus because they loved one another. Now these are people throughout the different cities that had seen these disciples grow up. They knew who these people were. They knew their downfalls and their mistakes and everything else. But they noticed a change at the heart level, and that was of love because they had spent time with Jesus. Now, even more with that being said, shouldn't that be said of us, that people are seeing a change in us because we spend time with Jesus? And because of that, we have a greater love for each other because of Jesus. And I want to go one, one step farther like before, and this is going to be stepping on all of our toes. This is not just the friends and family package. This is the frenemies. This is the enemies. This is those that we like to despise. We need to still love them just like Jesus loves us, and even more, love them unconditionally. Harder said than done, isn't it? But it starts here. It starts with me. It starts with you. So that we're able to go together, united, with a forgiving and loving spirit, no matter what's going on, seeking to bring more with us home so we can live together eternally. Now let's take a look at our last two verses in our last couple of moments together. Verse 18 says this, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. You know, we have that promise that because we love Jesus, because we are a part of Jesus, because we're in Jesus... There's going to be a lot around us that are going to hate us because of that fact. But even more than just that, the greater world itself 
is going to hate us. It's going to put us down. It's going to despise us. But even though that happens, we're called to still love the world, to still abide in Jesus, to still abide here while we're still here, and to show others his love as we continue to go on this journey together. Let's continue to make these connections as God calls us closer together. And even more, as we can continue to see how he's unfolding this life, and even more, how this greater unfolding is extremely glorious as we continue to look to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for reminding us yet again of how you want us to abide, how you want us to love, and even more, how you want us to be closer and closer in you, but not just individually, together. Guide us as we go and as we seek you in all things. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us today. I, I encourage you to take a look at the last part of John 15 so that you'll be ready for our last part, part three of the Abiding Factor series. Till then, I pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you. And I look forward to seeing you next time as we continue to study God's word together. God bless.